psychologist and augmentative alternative communication specialist in Victoria, BC. And I have the pleasure of being the moderator for this workshop today. And I'd like to introduce Marnina Alice, Karen Conti, Jean Marie Florkowski, Andreas Guerrero, Barbara Don Levy Hiller, and Diana Ryan today to talk about an interdisciplinary approach to assistive technology in the pediatric population. Welcome everybody to our session. Um, we are um, the AT core team here at Blightfield Children's Hospital and our population definitely falls in the complex pediatric population. Um, so we just wanted to give some insight into the team that we built and kind of the approach that we took in regards to using that interdisciplinary approach to get the most um, appropriate AT services for our children. Our team is multidisciplinary. Um, and what that allows us to do is give a comprehensive clinical approach to the child and their AT needs. And as you can see, each of us, oops, sorry. Each of us um, have a special skill set in a particular area of AT that we're able to bring to the table for that collaboration. So let's just go over some objectives first for um, this session. We want you to describe the different areas of assistive technology for assessment and implementation, identify interdisciplinary roles of AT team members, and also demonstrate increased knowledge of AT referral process and supportive services. We always like to start off with what is assistive technology. It's such a large term that encompasses so many different things. Um, most people know it as any piece of device or equipment, um, product system, whether you acquire it commercially or you modify and customize an item um, that basically is used to increase functional capabilities of a person with a disability across a variety of contexts. Um, the reason that we put this little um, icon or picture in is because we want you to notice that it's not just about the devices, but really it truly is about the services and what the services um, entails is not only the matching of the AT and the selection of the device, but also we look at the training, the training of the child, the training of the parent, and then as well as any follow up that might be needed if for reassessment for these children. Um, some of the kids that we see here, this um, gives an idea of how many different diagnoses um, we have here um, when we are assessing children for assistive technology. Um, and some are listed here, such as cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, spinal cord injuries, TBIs, those with learning disabilities or developmental delays, autism, visual impairment, stroke, and burns, to name a few. Some of our team players that we have when we are looking at the assessment process is we really try and gather as much information from the players within the child's life. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one team member. We like to incorporate, you know, seeing the teachers. And if they do do vision therapy in school, we want that information too um, to help us kind of lead the way and gain as much information about the child as we can. Um, it's not on purpose that we put student number one because we want them to be the most active participant that they can during this process, since they're the ones that are going to be utilizing the device or any of the products that we choose. So an interdisciplinary approach, um, basically the success of matching AT with the need is strongly affected by the AT, sorry, by the evaluation protocol and by the skill set of the multidisciplinary team. So the utilization of this approach fosters inquiry, problem solving, and learning from team members and allows for greater quality of outcomes within the AT service and delivery. And we truly believe that this approach um, does impact the way um, the service is provided for the children. It makes us um, check off each box of different areas of AT. And also we make sure that each area will seamlessly integrate with the other areas of AT in the child's life. When we look at um, that little icon that had the umbrella that showed device and service, um, we really wanted you to look at that service piece. And this is why we kind of, as a team member, not only just put ourselves together 
for wanting to do this, but we also are conscious of the fact of our quality and how to make ourselves better as clinicians and as the service and process that we're offering. Um, so some of the quality indicators for the assessment of assistive technology is that they're conducted by a team with the collective knowledge and skills needed to determine possible assistive technology solutions that address the needs and abilities of the client's demands of the environment and their functional goals. So really in the collaborative model, why we like this one um, is because all members of the team are able to contribute some of their talents to the work. And at various times during the process, the emphasis may be heavier on one member or another, depending on the needs of the child. So when we look at the service and the quality of service, we're really looking at what we're providing the child and their family. But we also as a team like to see outcomes for us as clinicians. So the goal of collaboration with our team is that we just wanna, it reaffirms decision-making, it organizes information in a comprehensive manner, and it broadens the interprofessional competencies of all teams involved. Um, so we get to learn about different areas and feel a level of competency across the board. Um, and it also provides a single point of contact for some of these families. So if they have a concern about a wheelchair or a communication device, then it's one point of contact um, for the family, which makes it a little bit easier. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit about our process here at Whitetail. And the first part of our process in regards to when we're kind of initiating that assessment is, is there a need identified? Um, and that need can be identified, whether it's seating mobility, computer access and adaptations or augmentative and alternative communication. That need can be identified by the family, by a doctor, by a therapist, by a school or the child themselves. Um, so what we want to do is once that need is identified, we want to start gathering as much information as we can before doing the formal assessment. So we kind of have a path of where our assessment should go. Um, and how we normally do that is we do send the family a formal referral packet, and we'll go into that a little bit later, but the referral packet will give us information on um, everything about the child that we need to do that assessment. Um, and then when the child is um, coming for an insurance-based evaluation, the child will be seen in-house by a physiatrist who completes the face-to-face -face medical contact requirement. For a child that's coming for a referral from a school district, we will then just formulate a, generate a contract with that school district. So once we have gathered that information and we feel like it's an appropriate fit for this child to be assessed by the team here, um, and we do have to make that determination to say, yes, we feel that th we can do justice to the child or the child might not be appropriate for um, what we can offer. So the interdisciplinary um, assistive technology evaluation will be initiated and usually it's all members of the core team um, will be present for every single AT evaluation. And then as the clinical discussion um, starts and continues, then there will be a direction of a lead member depending on the needs of the child, whether it's seating and mobility, whether it's computer access, or whether it's AAC. We do have the luxury of having a wonderful support team as well. So we have, who's also going to be speaking, we do have a rehab engineer on staff that helps us problem solve, which is wonderful. And we have a coordinator who seamlessly kind of helps us with the paperwork and the flow. So we do have that support team as well as um, any of the vendors or the rep reps from different suppliers. Um, we also have those as well. So after the assessment has been completed by the core team members, we do follow up with obvious documentation to generate a submit or to request a device um, through the specific funding source of that child. And once the approval is, the formal delivery appointment will be set up for instruction and education to support the use of that new device. Um, at this time, there's also information giving in regards to if there's further training that needs to be done. Um, seven is a huge one as well, because we always feel as a team, there needs to be ongoing support that we don't just hand over a device and let them be on their way. Um, there should be a follow-up and a reassessment if needed. 
whether it be for growth, whether it be for expansion of devices to other areas of AT, or whether it just be the skill performance of the child has improved or changed. So this is all of, um, when we're connecting the puzzle pieces for the child, we all have a valuable role in this team member, as a team member for this team. And we just wanted to show that through this um, puzzle picture here, um, just to show that we all work together, we're all integrated and we're all a valuable role in the team. So the first up is going to be Karen, who's gonna be touching, and Barb, who's gonna be touching base about seating and mobility. Hi. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Conti, and I'm the physical therapist that's part of the AT team, and I am in seating and mobility. And as you look at this picture, you'll see that there are many things involved in seating and mobility, not just wheelchairs, there's bath equipment, there's beds, there's car seats, and there's mobility aids. Um, in our um, assessment, it's what's happening is we are in, we're doing a, an interview with the family, with the child, and we're getting a medical interview. We're getting some social history on that child. We're, we're asking the family and the child or the client why they're here. Why did they come for this? We're looking at every environment that they are going to be in, whether it's going to be home, whether it's going to be school, whether it's going to be community. Some of our kids are going to camp now as well. So we have to also take that into account. Um, we're going to do a mat assessment. We're going to do a functional assessment. We're going to have them explore equipment because you don't want them, you want them to get the, the most appropriate equipment and you don't want them to um, abandon the equipment. And then we'll have a selection of a device. But again, in this comprehensive assessment, not only is there a speech there, not only is there a PT and an OT and um, some of the therapists, the OTs and PTs that we're training as well, but um, there's medical staff, whether it's the physiatrist or the nurse that accompanies the child. We have a vendor that's always present. And um, if we need, we can call on the people from our AT team uh, to do um, an assessment, whether we're talking about our speech therapist, Marnina, or we're asking Jean or Diana to come in and to help us with access, or we are calling in our rehab engineer, Andreas. Um, there may be times when they're not available. And at that point we would schedule um, an AT evaluation. Um, again, seating is, and positioning is very important. You have to remember the pelvis is their base of support. So if the pelvis is not neutral and it's forward or backwards, that's gonna affect how they can speak, how they can swallow and what they see. And the other thing too is their feet need to be on the floor because if their feet are not on the floor, they won't have a good base of support as well to make all those, do all those activities. Um, this is just a quick slide so that you can try some of these things at home. As you're sitting with your feet supported, you're sitting upright. Now, if you let your pelvis go back and you can see that where is your vision? Where are you reaching? Can you, can you speak very loudly? Now sit yourself back up in the middle and now lean forward. And again, you know, where is your vision? How is your reach? Can you really participate? in things, can you reach for an object? Can you operate a computer keyboard? So those are the things that you need to keep in mind. Um, you may see some tilt and space wheelchairs and those are chairs that angle in space as you can see from the, the pictures below. Um, and what's happening is we usually put um, clients in these chairs that have poor head control and poor trunk control. It helps with fatigue. It assists with their positioning and it provides pressure relief for them so that they can participate more in the activities that they need to participate. And now uh, you will have Barbara Dunleavy. Hi, I'm Barbara Dunleavy from the Seating and Mobility Service of our assistive technology um, program here at Blythedale. I had the opportunity to work with Karen and as she discussed, the first part of our um, comprehensive evaluation often is the seating and mobility. So when it 
when we look at mobility, we are a pediatric facility, we're looking at um, evidence-based practice, we're looking at research, we're looking at demystifying some of the myths out there and supporting family with the carryover of the needs of their children. When we look at motor, we're looking at different mobility devices. Karen had the slide that showed the vast array. It could be an ambulation assistive device. It could be a manual wheelchair. It could be a power wheelchair. It could be a variety of um, all of them. What we try to do is look and integrate mobility as early as the child developmentally would be expected to be mobile and initiating movement because it is such a core desire and a core um, factor in a child's development. So as we look at that, we're looking at the other areas of development, including cognitive development, social emotional development, visual motor, and it goes on and on. So we're really trying to, in our seating and mobility, be a comprehensive service that we're trying to educate that it is an evolution. It might not be the um, end mobility device, and we might integrate into programming use of power mobility when a child is advancing their skills, and they might um, go through a therapy program that they will be exposed to early mobility, and eventually they might obtain the goal of ambulation. But as a child moves through their environment, all of that rich cognitive exploration is going to, to help them develop their cause and effect and other concepts that um, if they are dependent, they don't develop. And unfortunately, it leads to learned helplessness and other dependency related um, behaviors. So we're trying to impact that and inhibit that development. And then as Karen mentioned with the tilt and space, looking at the orientation and positioning to know if they are going to access, whether it's just tabletop activities, written communication, verbal communication, the height of their positioning for others, that social, emotional communication, eye level with peers, looking at if they do need an orientation and space with the tilt and space so that they are not um, being put in a passive position, having a variety of positionings to help with their um, integration in their environment. So it is a comprehensive viewpoint that we try to take. And the advancement, like I mentioned about access, we have a component that we look at across the environments for an individual's day. And we're looking at the way they communicate and the method that they might, whether it's verbal communication or assisted communication and what access methods they might have explored or mastered. So it might be, are they directly accessing? Are they using an eye gaze system? And we try to incorporate that into their motor skills. So we might look at, okay, the child during their day um, for computer access or communication access, they're, they might be able to use their eyes, but it is a fatiguing small muscle group. So we look at other body parts and we might explore joysticks, a variety of customization to the joystick. We look at the handle of a joystick for um, assisting grasp and prehension. We look at alternative joysticks uh, or, or other alternative drive controls. You can use a head array at the head site. It could be a variety of uh, electronics. It could be proximity. It could be pressure switch style. And then we look at um, function across the domain of their day. Other, I know Jean mentioned it, and we're going to have the opportunity to hear from our rehab engineer, Andres. Um, we, as a team, look at, is it the right seating and mobility device? Is it the right access? And then it's the fine tuning, the programming, the sophistication built into the technologies and how we can utilize those to the advantages. So that's when we have a lot of team discussion and try to maximize um, the use of all of their um, technologies together. And there's a lot of Bluetooth Bluetooth technologies that are incorporated in mobility devices nowadays and other ways of integration. And Diana, I'm going to hand over in a moment. She will continue our puzzle piece on computer access and adaptations. All right. Thank you very much, Barb and Karen. Um, so the next puzzle piece that we're going to talk about is alternate access. So once you feel that you have a child in their optimal positioning, then you can start to explore the way that they access the world around them. 
So for some individuals with cognitive, physical, or sensory challenges, the ability to access a computer or a speech generating device may be the only way to really for them to express their knowledge base. Um, here at Blightsdale, we have children with complex medical needs, so they have impairments in multiple areas. So we're often um, working with children who we're assessing both alternate hardware and software supports to increase their participation, um, you know, to allow them to interact with their family, their friends, to play games on the computer, or to complete academic tasks within their classroom. So this is just a nice visual um, about access technology and all that it really encompasses. Um, so you can see here on the bottom, the first thing we're really looking at is positioning. So this um, takes into account the child seating and also any mounting that we're gonna do onto um, that wheelchair and where we're gonna position the device that they're using. Um, a lot of switches, there's a variety of switches and why you would use one versus another, but looking at switches to allow them to engage in cause and effect play or to access their computer or to scan through a speech generating device. Um, we can access technology also has um, adaptive mice and pointing devices. So that inclu includes things like trackballs and eye gaze systems, um, as well as keyboard access. So this is looking at different key guards that we can make. Um, like we had mentioned, we have a rehab engineer, so he can make custom key guards for us, which is awesome. Um, exploring different on-screen keyboards that can be used for a child. And then um, there's so many different iPads and tablets out there. So determining you know, what the child is using on a day-to-day -day basis and working within that platform to um, you know, help them to be able to access their device you know, at home and in school and across all of these different um, areas. So when it comes to access methods, we have you know, direct selection, and that would be touching a touch screen to select um, an icon and a speech generating device, or it could also be you know, selecting an icon with your eyes on an eye gaze system. Or an example of indirect selection could be you know, scanning using a switch. So when looking at access and we're doing an evaluation, um, again, looking at the child's positioning needs, um, from our perspective and what we bring to the table, we're going to assess the child's vision. Do they wear glasses? Are they able to visually focus on an object? Can they track an object? Are they able to turn their head to follow an object? We're gonna look at their upper extremity motor control. Are they able to um, reach for an art object accurately? Um, do you see over or under shooting? Is the child able to isolate their fingers to select icons on a touch screen? Are they able to um, sustain grasp on different items? So we're kind of looking at all of these things first before jumping to um, different access options that we can try to offer that child. So first, um, when we do our first trial, we're gonna look at the standard setup of operating systems. So um, we're gonna first start with standard equipment. So if we're looking at computer access, we're gonna start with a standard keyboard and a standard mouse and um, see if the child's able to access their device, maybe check just by changing some of the built-in accessibility options within that platform. If they're still having some trouble with that, we can start to look at alternate keyboard options and different mouse alternatives. So we're gonna assess clicking, double clicking, and click and drag. And there's a variety of different equipment out there. Um, so by looking at where they're still having trouble, it can kind of guide us in um, which device we might try next. And then if they're still not able to um, access their device with some of these um, standard um, access options, then we can go a little bit further. So we can look, do they need a touch screen and what kind of options for um, keyboard or access? Can they use their voice to type? So are we gonna use speech to text? And if this is too difficult, then can they use their eyes to access something um, start by playing a game and then seeing if they can use it 
on a speech generating device. If they have some deficits with visual skills, then we can go on to switch access. So there's a wide variety of ways that we can go to um, really try to allow that child to access their environment and participate um, in play with those around them. So this is just a visual um, looking at some alternate computer access options. So here you can see we have some switch access options. We have some key guards, um, alternate keyboards, some alternate mice. So I'm not gonna go into each one of them, but just know that it's out there and there's a variety of things um, that can be trialed to allow a child to um, be able to control their computer. And then um, that was more so on the hardware aspect. And then this is looking at software supports. So reading and writing supports. Um, this encompasses things such as word prediction and um, speech to text and some visual aids to help a child with reading. So again, looking at the interdisciplinary approach, we're looking at an interdisciplinary assessment um, but we're coming from the perspective of each individual discipline. So when we're looking at a co-assessment for accessing speech generating devices, first, um, both myself and the speech therapist, we're gonna look at the position of the child. We're gonna look at the position of the device and if it needs to be mounted and where. Um, we're gonna look at the layout of the screen. So do they need high contrast for visual deficits and then go into the grid and icon size. We'll go through the motor skills um, and if they need key guard or any other supports to allow them to access that speech generating device. And this here is just kind of a nice visual of a speech therapist and an OT working together um, to allow the child to access his speech generating device. And then from here, I will turn it over to Marnena for AAC. Okay, so I'm going to run through this really quickly because I think that most people who are participating in AAC in the cloud know the basic fundamentals of AAC and the things we're looking for when we do our evaluations. And I'd rather we have the time that you guys get to hear from the other people on the things that we do and the case studies we're going to do at the end. So I have a definition here of AAC. You know, it's anything that supplements, enhances um, people's verbal expression. And sorry, okay, we know all the myths that we have been busted with our current research. We do not have, um, you know, we're starting younger and younger with kids who giving them access to robust systems and giving them access to high tech um, vocabulary and presuming competence to allow them to do snug, spontaneous novel utterance generation. So you don't have to be completely nonverbal. We have lots of kids who use AAC devices who are coming in who might have scripted language, who might have unintelligible speech. So we're really just trying to start as young as possible with as many kids as possible. Um, so as I said, snug, presuming competence, robust language. Obviously we want a system that's core language based because we wanna give them as much bang for their buck in their system. Um, here you see some low to mid tech and on the next slide you're gonna see high tech. So obviously depending on the child's access is gonna drive what devices, what software. So based on what OT and PT have said about their positioning, we need to think about things like mounting, things about their selection method, their alternate access. So really having the team approach helps us know where to look in terms of what device is most appropriate. So again, when you're doing a comprehensive assessment of AAC, we're gonna look at all of these things, motor skills, language skills, literacy, sensory perceptual skills, and cognitive skills. And again, we're gonna look at some feature matching based on their access, the symbol set, the grid size, the vocabulary, obviously, as I said, we wanna do core based. Are we gonna think about Fitzgerald's key? Does the child speak a different language and what kind of team knowledge and training, you know, does the school all use one device or app? That's definitely, definitely something to look at in terms of training purposes and ease of everybody being on board. So just some quick um, um, screenshots of some popular apps that I think most people will know. So just going to scroll through these. Um, and again, just, you know, the importance of modeling and aided language stimulation. And now we're going to move on to Andres and the rehab engineering piece.
Hello, everyone. So my name is Andres Guerrero. I am the rehab engineer here at Blydell. So just so everybody will understand what is a rehabilitation engineer, uh, I like this um, definition from Reswick. Uh, he defined it as the application of engineering and other science in combination with medicine to improve the quality of life of disabled persons. Which other science he's talking about? Uh, it could be electronics, mechanics, biomedicine, software, materials. These are just like for uh, to give you an example what is component on the rehabilitation engineering. All of them focus to find a solution. So we were already talking about some of the needs that the kids have. So that's why uh, we try to apply as a team, like all the science, how, how can I able to create something for them? So my task as part of the AT team are the following. Uh, the first one is finding solutions to problems that require an engineering outcome. Uh, this could be done like trying to explore existing solutions, uh, how to customize something that already exists, uh, or if there's nothing in the market that actually could be uh, used, then is when I have to start designing something from, from scratch. Uh, another part that I am able to help the team, as uh, my team already told is about setting up equipment that is going to be using during the therapy sessions. Uh, the, a clear example of these are for wheelchairs that they have like so many different technologies or drive components that uh, I am able to set up before their session so they don't have to worry about that part uh, with the specific uh, needs that the kid and the therapist will uh, need for that specific moment. Uh, another part is trying to uh, do some research of what is on the market, what are the innovative technologies that are coming, not only on the aspect of um, medical equipment, but also uh, any other kind of assistive technology that we can use uh, for patients. Sometimes those devices are not even uh, like hospital use, but it could be like home use, but we can find that it could be a solution for some of our patients as well. So how I'm able to uh, help them or assist my team is I count with um, assistive technology laboratory where I have the equipment that I can uh, basically prototype equipment. If one example of this that we talk about are key guards. You can see an example. Uh, on the right, this key guard was designed for us with the specific um, uh, requirement that the therapy had. So for example, there's a key that would like to pull the key guard um, or you have like a, a certain visual impediment. So we're trying to make it like it could be as fit as they, as they need. Uh, another example are uh, on the one in the middle, we have like a customized uh, writing tool for a kid uh, that was not able to hold a, a pen. So basically we try to figure out a way that he can hold it in any setup, any kind of uh, market pen, and in any kind of angle. So he was able to use this during his therapy sessions or at home. So to explain how is my design process work, basically, as, I, as we talked before, we start trying to identify a need. Um, I'm gonna explain all this process with an example so it could be uh, more clear. So here I have like a need statement that is a way to allow a person to reach uh, the food release on their own on a manual wheelchair, so it can be performed without any external assistance. Uh, because this was um, a true case that I have uh, to do here at the hospital, the uh, child was not able to bend to reach uh, the food release. So the therapist asked me to build something that it could solve this uh, problem. Uh, something that I always have to do at the beginning is do some research uh, trying to see if there's already a, a device that we can just get it from our providers. So I talk with uh, all the people that I have here or my team, the, uh, the, the different therapies that are involved here on the process to see if there's a, already see something that we can just uh, use or in some case adapt for this uh, specific need. If there was nothing on, like in this case, is when I start de uh, developing our, my own device. So here you can see like uh, that I have like the manual wheelchair is one, it's had like a foot release on the, on the uh, show it on the on green. So 
basically what I'm trying to build is designing something on a software, see if it's gonna actually geometrically work. I try to simulate uh, to see if it's actually gonna be able to be, uh, I use 3D printed technology. So is there something that I can be able to build here? If I had the material, have the components, when I have all, everything solved, I is when I start um, actually building the device. So here we can see the implementation of, of the gadget that I made for the patient. So basically something that could be attached directly to the wheelchair. And as you can see in the, on the picture on the right, it is a device that is telescopic. So it, the kid, it doesn't need to bend so much, just like reach the blue uh, component here, pull it, and then is able to remove, uh, to release the food plate. So in that case, the patient can do it by himself uh, without any further assistance. After this, I do a follow up with um, with the therapists and their families to see how the pro uh, how the device goes, uh, and all of this is focused on being able to prototype devices that are not only a solution for our patient but also could be a solution for. Uh, future patients in other parts of the world as well. That's like our main goal someday. And um, now we're gonna explain uh, our way to collaborate as a team using some um, uh, cases. Okay, we're gonna present to you our case study. Um, this gentleman, Z, I'll, I'll call him, he's a three-year-old with a progressive neuromuscular disorder. Um, and you'll see that um, I'm very careful when I'm positioning him in the power wheelchair. I'm making sure that his, he's all the way back, his hips are back, um, that he's well supported, and that he's secured in the chair because he needs to be able to access things. So here we are. Um, his occupational therapist, myself and Andreas, we were looking at, again, his position to access um, the drive. And you can see he's looking forward, looking for his, his, his Dynavox. And there is his um, sensory switch. It's going a little fast, but that's okay. Yeah, he's an eye gaze user. Mm -hmm. So he's using the eye gaze for the communications device, but he's using a proximity switch to drive the chair. Mm -hmm. So in a minute, you'll see his hands just has to come close to the switch to make it go. And he was very motivated to move. So using the communications device during the movement was a yes. very motivating thing for him. So you can see they're adjusting the switch to get it close enough that he can activate it. Yes. But mm -hmm. clearly, we want it to be intentional and not accidental. So you really see our whole team approach here. And he was, I think we would ask him, do you want to go, go more? And he would give you that response. And he had a very small amount of movement and we were able to capture it at that point. So placement was, was very important to him accessing it. The excitement when he was able to go, I mean, his face lit up. This was yes. something that was so <clears throat> enjoyable and motivating for him. Mm -hmm. And I think his dad got to saw him drive in person the first day. And this is when we asked him, you know, did you really like driving today? And how was it for you and dad? And he said he wants, I think he said he wanted to do more. Exactly. Giving these kids the opportunity that they wouldn't otherwise have. So I have the honor of doing another case study for one of our children here. Um, this little boy had a neurological disorder that um, he was on a vent for 24 hours and significant um, limitations in his movement, as well as um, significant joint contractures. Um, he, because of the vent, he did speak, um, but his articulation, depending on his fatigue, um, really kind of varied. So. Um, we had to look at also not only using his voice, but in order for him to clearly state his, um, for safety reasons, what he needed, 
Um, we also looked at a different um, communication style. So for mobility purposes, he really is a social child um, and wanted to get out there and be around people. So we started to use a joystick that supported his arms. And the joystick is specialized in regards to it's a high sensitive but low pressure joystick. So we were able to offer him that through for power mobility. And he also used an eye gaze for communication on the days that he couldn't use his voice. And he was able to use um, a mouse where we adapted an actual head mouse and that he used that head mouse for on his hands because when she changed position, if he's in bed or if he's in the chair, his function dramatically changed. So we had to make sure that he was supported in different ways. So he was a great example of using multiple access methods to meet the needs of his, you know, the child that you have. So our next one. So this case study, Andres and I are going to explain a little bit about um, a young boy that is part of our program here. He was three years old when we started exploring some power mobility. He has a diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy. He's on a ventilator for respiratory support. His mobility is extremely limited. So the speech language pathologist, along with the occupational and physical therapist, all looked at his needs, looked across the environment environments and really wanted to open up through access, mobility, communication, access for leisure and schooling. So he, through his speech language pathology program, he actually is using an eye gaze system for some communication. His physical therapist and occupational therapist that you see in the video on the left, were doing early exploration of power. And you could see the therapist on the right of him had to actually tactily prompt him, give him some physical cues. And behind him is his physical therapist who was trailing with the respiratory support so that um, they could both manage his needs while they were out and about in the open area. And then through programming, we discussed with the rehab engineer and with the team some programming, some modifications, and Andres will explain some of the printing that he incorporated into this program. So some of the modifications I did on his power wheelchair are I customized the handle. If you can see it on the picture down, the orange part that he's holding is that a handle that practically it is made for exactly the size, the size and the position of his hand. Also it had like an elbow support that is also in orange. This is also totally made according to his measurement and also the position that he needs to be able to drive. So these two parts were like really uh, important for him to be able to drive without any external assistance as we saw in the first video. Uh, with this modification, he was able to turn, go uh, forward. Some other change that we did on the, on the programming of the power wheelchair was that instead of him like pushing the handle to go forward, he pulled it. Uh, and the last modification uh, we did on the power wheelchair was uh, an attachment for the ventilators. So now you can see that the, uh, that the child was driving without somebody holding it. So basically one therapist was able to do the whole program. And now we're going to switch back to Marnina and Karen for the last of our case studies. Okay, so this is um, a young lady who had multiple strokes. Mm -hmm. She was an eye gaze user. Um, so when she was in her wheelchair, she had um, a device mounted, but she was very motivated by her iPad and music videos and being able to control that. So here you see the whole team, PT, OT, speech, working on switch access because we would also have a single switch mounted on her wheelchair tray um, to help her um, control her iPad. Okay. Excuse me. 
So just to finish up, we wanted to give you a little bit of information on our referral process. So our referrals are made um, by physicians, school systems, therapists, and families, as Jean mentioned earlier. Sorry. Um, all of our medical referrals, so all of our insurance-based evaluations, first have to see an in-house physiatrist, and our school-based referrals, we have a contract. And just our referral packet um, touches on all of the following um, areas listed below. We get demographic information, seating position and mobility information. Did they have a chair? Are they looking for a chair? Any vision and hearing information, access, computer use, how they can compose written material, their communication skills, and then um, academics, learning, literacy, general information. We really wanna to touch on a little bit of everything and start our evaluation with as much as possible. Okay, so here's our, um, our coordinator, Tracy, is our main point of contact. So you have her number and um, email above. Our seating and mobility, that's for our computer access and AEC. And for the seating mobility, that's the equipment clinic email and phone number. Um, we're always happy to collaborate and troubleshoot and work together with a variety of team members. And references and questions. All right, I don't see any questions on um, on the Slack at the moment. We can give it a, a second. Uh, there was a, a question as to whether there were going to be slides available. Um, yeah, we can send that in, sorry. Okay. Thanks. I'll just wait a second. Sure. Okay, I don't see any questions. So on behalf of AAC in the cloud, I'd like to thank you all. That was very, very interesting and gave us great insights into the workings of um, assistive technology. So we very much appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone.